This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us once again on Mises Weekends. I'm very pleased to have as our guest today, John Williams, who is the proprietor and founder of a, a very important and a great website called shadowstats.com. It's a site that uh, I've been familiar with since a long time ago, back in my days working for Ron Paul. Um, we used to use John's information and data in, in some of Dr. Paul's speeches and statements. Uh, John holds a couple of degrees from Dartmouth College, and he worked uh, for many years in the private sector uh, for Fortune 500 companies as a consultant and economist for them. But as I mentioned, he now runs shadowstats.com. And if you're not reading it and you're not familiar with him, I think you would do yourself a great favor by reading the site and becoming familiar with him. So with that, uh, John, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for having me. Well, let me ask you kind of a tongue-in-cheek question before we get into the meat of things. We've been hearing a lot lately about fake news. That seems to be the story of the day. And it struck me when I was looking at your site earlier today, should we be thinking of government-issued statistics like CPI and GDP as fake, at least in a certain sense of the word? Absolutely. What you'll see here is that uh, the problems are in most instances, definitional, definitional, where the, the methodologies have been changed over the years, but the methodologies that have been uh, changed have generally been counterintuitive to what most people expect in the numbers, so that you end up with um, uh, the headline uh, economic details overstating uh, economic growth and uh, understating inflation, and that is deliberate, and I, I really find that uh, criminal. Well, deliberate in the sense that the government always wants to look good. It always wants to paint a rosier scenario than than reality might posit. Well, not not just that. If you go back to the uh, 1990s, now in Greenspan was the one who led the uh, charge here. The move was made to restate inflation for purposes of cutting the federal budget deficit. Alan Greenspan's position was uh, simply... The CPI, that's a headline number that uh, still is published today on inflation, overstated inflation, and that if only we had a more accurate number, a number with <clears throat> lower inflation, that that would reduce uh, government spending in the terms of uh, cost of living adjustments to people on um, Social Security. It would also increase tax revenues by bo boosting uh, taxpayers into higher income tax brackets than they were. So he... Um, proposed and uh, along with the Boskin Commission set up a number of changes to the uh, CPI inflation aimed at reducing CPI. But if you asked him what's wrong with the CPI, how is it overstated? His response would be, well, suppose uh, steak gets very expensive and people buy more hamburger. If they buy more hamburger, their cost of living isn't as great. But that's not reflected in the CPI, so the CPI overstates inflation. Well, what you have to consider here and what you have to understand is the way most people view a cost of living measure and the way or the various inflation measures have been um, viewed over time. And I'm, I'm talking here centuries. I mean, you have uh, price indices that go back literally centuries. The idea has always been to measure inflation from the standpoint of uh, maintaining a constant standard of living. Prices are rising. What kind of an adjustment do I need to make to my income or to my investment strategy so that I can at least live as well as I did last year? But the changes that were made here where you they introduced substitution effects or, or tried to at least and tried to mimic that in the, in the headline CPI, the effects there were to um, give you something that was not uh, measuring a constant standard of living. It was effectively measuring a declining standard of living. I mean, if you can go from steak to hamburger, you can go from hamburger to dog food, which unfortunately has happened to some people I, I know of that have, uh, just can't live on the adjustments that they've gotten on their, uh, for, for example, Social Security. And that was that was done deliberately to reduce the cost of living adjustments. And, and that, that I, I can't buy. I mean, there, there have to be better ways to... Um, the balance the budget than lie to people. It's absolutely criminal. I think you're correct. But what, again, when I worked for Dr. Paul, 
We used to talk about the Fed tax, and Dr. Paul defined that loosely as, let's say, the difference between the real rate of inflation, not CPI, but the, what we might call the real rate of inflation, and the, the interest rate one could get on a reasonable, non-esoteric uh, you know, certificate of deposit or simple savings account. And the difference between those two is the Fed tax. If you accept that definition, it, it seems to me, maybe I, you have a different view, that the Fed tax is about as high or higher than it's ever been. The, in other words, the delta between interest rates one can easily earn and what you're really losing in inflation. Yeah, I, I, that's a fair, it's, it's got to be at a record. I get, it gets worse each year because the, the changes that have been made here are, are cumulative. And they were not just changes that were made with uh, Greenspan in the 1990s. They started back in the 1980s changing the way CPI was calculated and estimated. And the changes there over time have had an aggregate impact of about uh, five percentage points that they publish and admit to as changes in methodology. And there's another couple of percentage points on there for changing uh, elements such as uh, going from mom and pop shops downtown to malls out in the uh, the highway where people uh, tend to buy cheaper products. And that's, uh, well, you say, well, that's what I do. Again, this has not been handled in a way that handles things consistently in terms of measuring what would be a, a maintaining a constant standard of living. Now, what they did here, they, they recognize that there's a problem. You have the um, government's uh, tip instruments, the, the treasuries that are adjusted for inflation. And I believe you'll find somewhere in the background of those documents that if they change the methodology, they have to adjust the pre-existing tip instruments. Well, they've been very careful not to have any so-called methodological changes since it would affect that. But a real simple thing, and this was just just to give you an idea, and it was more a matter of rounding than anything else, but if you look at the cost of living adjustment that uh, came out of the uh, CPI this last year for adjusting uh, Social Security payments, I believe it was three-tenths of a percent, they made a, a correction to um, one of their adjusted numbers. And it was, it was just a real small one. You wouldn't see it in most of the aggregate numbers, but the way it worked out, the effect was it knocked the uh, headline adjustment uh, to three-tenths of a percent from what would have been four-tenths of a percent. Many people rely on the government's numbers. It's not just government uh, elements, but people out in, in the private sector. Landlords often will have their their rental um, fees uh, escalated by the CPI. They're not getting an even uh, an even bet. And if, if you're basing your investment return on trying to beat the government's CPI measure, you're uh, doing yourself a disservice there because you're not keeping up with inflation. I think that would pretty much confirm what you're saying about that Fed tax actually expanding. It continues to year after year. Well, let's talk a little bit about inflation as it relates to the monetary base and then the broader money supply, one measure of which M3 uh, is no longer compiled by the Fed, but it's compiled by you. Uh, talk to people just generally about, you know, the monetary base has has expanded more than four times since the crash of 08, 09. And a lot of Fed apologists will say, well, gee whiz, that's not the money supply. And as long as that money is sitting there parked more or less as bank reserves, and it's not sloshing around in the general economy, uh, it saved the banks, it provided them solvency or liquidity. And and why should we care if the monetary base is quadrupled? Uh, I, I say we should care, but I'd like to hear what you say. Well, let me put it this way. The, the US government has a tremendous solvency problem long term. Unfunded liabilities, net present value, uh, but with the existing liabilities such as the federal debt, in excess of a hundred trillion it can never it can never be covered as things exist. The Fed's quantitative easing, what they did here, was uh, not at all as represented. You go back to 2008, you had the collapsing banking system. The Fed, the Treasury got together. There's a general agreement. Absolute agreement. We will not let the system collapse. Now, the Fed, yes, the Fed says it has a mandate uh, to keep the economy growing, to contain inflation. Their primary function is to keep the banking system afloat. They had failed. The banking system was collapsing, and uh, we shouldn't have been in that position, but it's a 
I mean, you have to think real hard as to what you want to do. You let the system go or not. They decided to save the system at all costs. And what they did was there's all sorts of stopgap measures uh, guaranteed, whatever had to be guaranteed. They they uh, bought companies, they funded companies like AIG. They did whatever they had to do to keep the banking system afloat. The quantitative easing, initially, you'd think, my goodness, a monetary base was a was a tool usually used to control the to um, either up or lower the uh, the growth rate of the money supply, but that in, involved the uh, in the monetary base generally going into the flow of commerce with banks lending. Now, had the banks been allowed to lend some of this money, uh, that might have helped the economy some. It would have gone into lending, would have kept. Uh, the commerce going a little better than it did. The problem was the banking system was collapsing. And the Fed, not that they could do much to stimulate the economy, but they, they didn't even think of it. They were looking at saving the banks. Problem was the public was getting um, a little uncomfortable with bailing out the banking system. So that um, whenever the Fed upped its uh, quantitative easing, it was doing so in response to negative economic news or doing this to save the economy. That was their political cover, did nothing to save the economy. It did help to uh, provide some liquidity to the banking system. But guess what? All these treasuries that they were buying also were effectively uh, monetizing the, the federal debt. In the period of time where they're act actively buying the treasuries, they effectively monetized 75% of the new debt issuance, uh, public debt issuance of, of the Federal Reserve. Now, that should have been very inflationary, and it will be, because we're coming back to that. That's the, that we're not, we're not finished with salvaging the banking system here. But when they ceased the uh, quantitative easing, so to speak, they, they did not liquidate their treasury hold, or the, the treasury holdings. They're still holding $2.5 trillion there in, in treasuries. The treasury pays them interest, but the, the Fed pays the interest back to the treasury. That, that's fully monetized. They might as well just write it off. And it's, uh, that's where you get into big trouble down the road with inflation, and it's where it's, um, I'll tell you how we get there very soon. But the issue there is that the uh, if you don't have the ability to pay what you owe, which is the U.S. government does not, you either have, you have to borrow it or you have to print the money. The Treasury has been borrowing. Uh, they were ha actually were having some funding problems. It got downgraded by the uh, by S and P back in uh, 2011. You started to see some rapid flight from the, the dollar and then all sorts of interventions. What what happened there, though, with the Fed's intervention, effectively saved the Treasury as well as the, the banks because the Fed, again, was monetizing that debt. Now, if you look at the circumstance today, the rest of the world is pretty much dumping Treasuries. They're not, they're not buying them. Uh, China, Japan, South Korea, you know, big former big buyers of Treasuries, they're, they're, they're not buying. The Federal Reserve still the uh, out there with 2.5 trillion, and they have a banking system that still is not uh, solvent. It hasn't worked. Hasn't worked globally. We're at a point where there's a talk you're going to have a an imminent uh, rate increase. It may happen, maybe not. But following that, that does not preclude further quantitative easing. You have an economy that is uh, never fully recovered from the crash into 2009. It's uh, turning down again. That puts more stress on the banking system. The banking system is still not solvent or fully solvent. Got all sorts of problems there. They're not lending normally. The Fed's going to have to go back in and increase uh, quantitative easing again, buying up the treasuries. But I would expect them to do the same thing they did before, effectively monetizing the debt. This is something you'd expect at the end of the cycle when the U.S. couldn't pay off its bills and just printed monies, monies and, and put you into hyperinflation. The monetization there does have a very big inflationary effect and, and should lead to very bad inflation down the road. Among other things, right now, what, what's helped contain the circumstance has been all sorts of jawboning. Yes, oh, we're going to raise interest rates, which helps to prop the dollar. And as long as they can prop the dollar and, and try and bring in some money from abroad, that's one thing. But as they, they turn back to the quantitative easing, which I think you'll see early in uh, 2017, the uh, dollar will be dumped, and uh, you'll see uh, a tremendous amount of dollars being put back into the system. The Fed's got to absorb. Uh, there's going, going to be quantitative easing. They're going to be buying treasuries, and that will 
that will affect the money supply and that will spike the money supply and it will give us a, um, a tremendous inflation problem. In terms of M3, why they stopped doing it, I don't think it was for the reasons why they stopped covering it. I do not believe it was for the reasons they expressed. They said, oh, it's too expensive to track and report and it didn't give them any new information. Well, so they're reporting M1 and M2. M1 is just basically cash or near cash, like checking accounts. M2 includes um, savings accounts, uh, small time deposits. M3 takes you into large time deposits, uh, CDs, uh, uh, institutional money funds, uh, your dollar accounts. Uh, if you follow the small time deposits and um, money funds, why wouldn't you follow the, 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 the bigger ones? M2 is something like 60% of M3. And what we've been seeing recently is that uh, you've had very, we've seen a, a big pickup in M2 and uh, M1 growth, but it hasn't been happening in M3. What's been happening with them is that you, you've seen some liquidation in those larger accounts that I still follow. The Fed still has those numbers. It's not that they don't have the numbers. They could put it together if they wanted to. But this growth that you're seeing, which some people consider to be healthy, others uh, say it's in, they're worried about inflation, actually is, is not inflationary as it looks because it reflects these funds uh, that are generally being liquidated out of M3 into the, let's say, the M2 accounts. So that where the numbers weren't in M2 before, now they are, and it makes M2 look larger. That's all uh, smoke and mirrors. We're not yet at the brink of a real serious inflation with those uh, money supply numbers, but watch this next round of quantitative easing because as soon as that kicks in, all, all the other factors that will uh, be negative from the standpoint of an expanded money supply will be in place. The inflationary pressures will start to mount. The dollar selling will intensify. The dollar I look for the dollar as we know it to become effectively worthless. And in the process, if you're an individual, what you need to look at is preserving your wealth and assets. If you live in a dollar-denominated world, gold is the primary hedge there. Silver is as well. Physical gold, physical silver that will preserve the purchasing power of, of your uh, current assets going forward. And, and you have a circumstance like that, and all of a sudden you start to see rapid inflation. Gold right now has been hit very heavily. And a lot of that's deliberate intervention by the uh, central banks, selling by the central banks, trying to discourage ownership of it. But when the inflation begins to surface, when the renewed selling of the dollar picks up, you're going to see the inflation fears rise and along with that gold prices. But if gold gets up to 10,000 or when it gets to 10,000 or when it gets to 100,000, you don't want to just take your run and take your profits. Because when you get to that point, what that's telling is you're in the middle of a major inflation problem, one that is going to, uh, as I see it, end up in the complete debasement and uh, devaluation of the dollar. The dollar will become worthless. So that you, where you buy the gold, the concept there is it's a hedge. This is not, I mean, there are people I'd love to do day-to-day -day trading it. That's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having this as a store of wealth, uh, something to that protects you against the inflation ahead. You have to hold it through the crisis. If you hold it through the crisis, you will have kept intact and liquid the um, purchasing power that you had in your assets before the crisis. Well, it's interesting. You talk about what the Fed's doing and more QE possibly in 2017. Does it ever amaze you how, they, how they're able to change their tune? It wasn't that long ago, 2011, 2012 where uh, the, the St. Louis Fed chair, uh, Bullard, was talking about how they were going to unwind all this $2.5 trillion of, of treasury debt that they bought. And, and just a couple months ago, Ben Bernanke at, at their conference at, at Jackson Hole in Wyoming said, well, we might have to rethink that and, and even consider expanding the Fed's balance sheet a little bit. I, I mean, it's almost like the, the financial press has amnesia and, and, and still imagines that there's a plan of some sort. Well, the press plays along with us. I mean, the financial press is largely controlled by Wall Street, and uh, the interests there are the same as the Feds. They, they just they just want to keep the uh, system as uh, liquid as possible and make as much money off it as possible. But the problem is that it's not good for the average guy, and it's, it sure is not good for the system over the long haul. The system's effectively been, been bankrupted. 
We have a new administration coming in. And uh, there's talk of fiscal stimulus. Fiscal stimulus should generate some economic activity. The problem is there's a lead time there, nine months to a year, before you start seeing it hit the economy. Of course, there's impact on the deficit, depending upon how that's uh, worked and where there's hope that uh, you know an expanding economy in the future will generate revenues to bring down the uh, deficit or control the deficit. The problem is the long-term solvency issues of, the, of the, the sovereign solvency issues of the United States. That has to be addressed in the context of um, whatever stimulus is put in place here. If that well, the long-term solvency issues can be handled, brought in into some kind of a credible form of control, then they have a they've got a clear shot for whatever they want to do. But if they don't, you have a circumstance where the uh, as the uh, stimulus packages are put in place, there will be. I'd be very surprised if there's not some increase, at least short term, in the federal deficit. The process there will focus the global markets again on the on the long term dollar insolvency. I mean, there's no question, you know, that unless the circumstance is brought under control for the United States at some point in time, the dollar becomes worthless, which is no way that we can cover the obligations. That circumstance has to be controlled. That's what that's what brought the system near uh, the brink again in uh, 2011. We were at the brink in 2008, but again, everything they did there was stopgap, and very little, if anything, was done to address the underlying issues that brought us in. Nothing was done to turn the economy around. The solvency issues were not addressed, and they, they did some stuff to address the banking system, but again, the banking system at this point still is not normal. It's not right. Not lending as it should be. That's all part of the crisis. Effectively, the system collapsed in 2008, and the Fed just hasn't figured out how to uh, how to get around that. They, they keep promising raising rates, and they've been doing that for the last year since they hiked rates in uh, December of 2015. And now, many people look at a virtual certainty they'll do it again in 2016. I, I know this is the day or so before that it's being recorded, but whether or not they do that, that does not preclude what's going to happen in the next uh, couple of months into 2007 as the economy continues to sink. Seeing that in a lot of good leading indicators to economic activity, industrial production down year to year for now for five quarters. You've never seen two consecutive quarters. We now have five consecutive quarters. Never seen two consecutive quarters of annual decline in industrial production that's been outside of a formal recession. And that goes back to the founding of the uh, index in uh, the post-World War I era, about the same time and a little bit after the founding of the Fed. You look at help wanted advertising. You don't have the newspaper index the way you used to, but you uh, do have an online advertising index that's uh, surveyed by the conference board. And and the the, uh, newspaper index used to be the best leading indicator around. And that one in the year-to-year decline, particularly if you're down 10, 15%, you always had a recession. Again, that goes back to uh, post World War One. We're seeing patterns now in the uh, online index. It's a new, relatively new index, but it, it predicted and, and tracked very closely the economic collapse that uh, began in 2006, 2007, into 2009, and uh, it's been showing a new one in place now. In the near future, you're going to see a lot more in the way of uh, a downturn in the headline data. And that again pushes the Fed back into the into the quantitative easing. They just don't have a way to handle it. It's not a happy circumstance. And if you don't think they're going to uh, work things out, good place to be is to buy a little bit of insurance, such as with gold. Well, it's it's not a happy circumstance, as you say. It's it's smoke and mirrors, I'm afraid. And we're out of time. But let me just wrap up by saying I wouldn't want to be Janet Yellen right now, and I wouldn't want to be Donald Trump either. Our guest is John Williams. Again, his website is shadowstats.com, all one word, shadowstats.com. Do yourself a favor, check it out. It's an absolutely fascinating site. It has quite a bit of information in front of the paywall that may well entice you to become a paid subscriber. Uh, John, I want to thank you for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, you have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.